Great, thanks. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to have our leaders panel hard talk with Nicholas Clayton and Don Sheeney. And um, to moderate this session is Nada Alamedine, who is Regional Director of Sales and Marketing for Hadama Consulting Services. Um, Nada joined uh, Hadama in, in 2010, I believe. She you also do quite a bit of work teaching as well yeah. um, at St. Joseph's University. University, yeah, University that's right, okay. And having spoken to Nada last night uh, during the reception, I think more than 50% of your business now is food and beverage. Food and beverage. Exactly. So we've got a great expert to lead our next session. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Jonathan. So I'd like to welcome on stage Nicholas Clayton, Chief Operating Officer of the Jumeirah Group. You sit. Great. So uh, Nicholas joined the group in April 2012, uh, coming from the Viceroy Group, where he initially joined in 2006 as president and eventually took over the responsibilities as chief executive officer of the business. Previously, Nicholas spent 13 years with Ritz Carlton. He joined later Mandarin Oriental in 2001 as senior vice president for operations. He was responsible, in addition to the 18 European and Asian hotels, of the food and beverage and spa divisions globally of the group. So welcome, welcome, Nicholas. And our session today is going to be about pioneering a new way of thinking and operating in a global environment that is market-driven. So my first question for you would be, what would you say that our industry is mainly driven by our consumers or there are other influencers? First, now let me say that that introduction was somewhat embarrassing to sit next to you and have you do that. Uh, the other thing is it, um, it demonstrates how old I am, which I didn't appreciate. Just kidding. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, to meet some of you for the first time and in some cases because it is a small world, kind of come back around and uh, reconnect with some. But uh, the question was really about, um, is it consumer driven? The, the business of restaurants, of food and beverage, is it consumer driven or other influences? Um, I would have to say that the consumers have, you know, made a decision about fine dining over the last several years. They've made a decision that they'd probably like to have a little bit more fun dining uh, than fine dining. So I think that the consumers have influenced um, healthy trends in cooking. The consumers can inf uh, influence uh, an ethnic preference. So I think the consumers are, you know, in the end, that's the, um, uh, that's the, uh, the guest, the customer that pays the bill. And so I think it's very much consumer led. However, I also believe that some very clever and very creative restaurateurs um, have done an outstanding job of introducing new trends, new opportunities, and how to enjoy food. Um, the combination of different ethnic groups of food, uh, and I think that the the inventors in the industry can influence the consumers. Um, so I think it's a bit of a push and pull. I think it's a, they, they've both got tremendous influence on the trends that we see today and that we'll see tomorrow and the next day. Great. And with your extensive experience in, uh, in food and beverage and in hotels and working for so many international hotel chains, uh, why do you think hotel operators sometimes struggle to effectively deliver food and beverage long-term results in terms of brand and profits? The, um, I tell um, the people I've worked with over the years that are maybe not as inclined uh, to have the experience in food and beverage, let's say some of the general managers in our group or in previous groups, I tell them that this part of the business is the most complex part. Um, you know, driving RevPAR and uh, filling the hotel, that's probably the most important part, but certainly the most complex part is having sustainable success in food and beverage operations. Um, I think that hotel operators tend to um, 
tend to focus a little bit more on the cost and the evolution of the people tends to come from within the business. Uh, it's that um, story about the assistant room service chap that wants to become a food and beverage director one day in their career, and so they move from position to position and ultimately find they've reached that goal, but at no time did that person want to be a restaurateur. At no time did that person want to focus on kind of owning a business and driving success in marketing, serving, selling. They were simply looking for a career path. So I think hotel operations, if uh, we stay kind of in the mindset that we've been in the past, we simply will have mediocre operations. And I'm kind of speaking globally because, of course, you have some regional advantages in places like Dubai and the licensing and so forth and so on. There's some things that make the playing field a little less equal. But I think globally, uh, you've got to take on a mindset of an independent restaurant tour to be successful on, over a sustainable period of time. Okay. So basically, uh, I guess with the Jumeira group, you've got your own concepts and you've got uh, probably as well concepts that uh, you, you got from third parties at the hotel. Uh, we can see already uh, that there are two types of players in the market. We've got the small mom and pop restaurants and we've got the major chain. And we know that each should be having a different strategy for marketing, for penetrating uh, the market share, for tapping new markets. So what would be your insight about that if we wanna be looking at the hotel, uh, at the hotel uh, experience versus the, mm -hmm. the, the, the ones which are outside? We have uh, about two years ago we as a hotel group decided that specifically in Dubai that we would take our 100 outlets and we would manage a good number of them as freestanding units. We started to calculate down to net profit, signing rents, allocating dollars, durhams to the costs as, as would be appropriate. We created a general manager model in order to um, create great leadership in the front of the house. Uh, went to find selectively the most talented chefs for the concepts. And so we really, for a survival, for, for a point of survival and success and building the brand and profitability, we've changed the mentality of how we'd like to manage our restaurants. Of course, I'm, I'm speaking about marquee restaurants where you're competing with some of the best freestanding product in, in the city or in the region. So that's just kind of addresses uh, this kind of change in mindset that I noted earlier. The, I, I think uh, we've all seen a tremendous amount of people want to get into the restaurant business at some point in their lives. And I always shake my head and wonder why. Because um, if they've never been there, if they've really never done that, they don't know the hard work and effort that's involved in it. They don't realize that if you're not willing to sacrifice and be there every single day yourself, you probably won't fly to begin a restaurant uh, uh, group, to begin a, a restaurant venture. So it is not for the faint at heart, I don't have to tell you all that, but it does amaze me those people that cook a good dish at home and feel like they can translate that into a profitable business uh, in a freestanding market. So uh, I think that the, the, the smaller businesses, the independent restaurants that have been successful, I started thinking what are the common factors and a lot of it kind of traces back to family owned Sometimes family-owned businesses are very successful because they get a collaboration and they realize that it's going to be the income of the family. So they really work hard and they sacrifice and then they find themselves in a successful, uh, sustainable business. Uh, that doesn't mean that's always how the independents are successful, but many of them that I kind of thought through my mind, been there a long time, it's because it's a generational issue. It's being passed on. Um, you know, restaurant groups... Uh, the bigger organizations, I mean, these are, these are very dynamic, these are very dynamic companies and their innovation and their professionalism is how they survive. So they're setting, you know, the trends, they look at the restaurant business completely differently, uh, how they market it, uh, how they drive their concepts. So I think that uh, those groups that are the strongest and the best will continue to thrive and those that are less, um, less dynamic and perhaps, um, have less favorable output, they, they, will not sac uh, they will be sacrificed, especially during times like 09, 
10 and 11 where the market just shakes out fluff and the people of substance remain. So I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, you did. Some way, <laughs> shape, or form. Yeah. Now, our last question, because we're running out of time. Today in the morning, we had the chance to have breakfast at uh, uh, Schwa from the celebrity chef, Garnier. Yes. So I'd like just uh, from you to tell us how important you think it is to be partnering with a celebrity chef. I've um, had some, some experience with that. And I have to say, I today would remain very open um, I think that uh, with the right space and the right kind of partnership that this can add tremendous value. Um, and other times, for example, I have some premium real estate that I just would not want to give up four or five points in the top line. I know that I'm successful with it, running it in-house, that type of thing. Find the best, let's call it um, non-celebrity uh, for that particular food type. So I, I, say, I say that you should stay open to any business model because if your portfolio is big enough and you try to same, apply the same rule for every box or every space, you probably will get it wrong. You need to be flexible and adaptable. And so I think that these are great opportunities. I've seen, the very, I've seen them work very well and we've all seen those that have failed simply because of momentum, steam, demand, whatever it may be. So. I'm, uh, I, I, w I want to say that I'm a flexible fellow when it comes to new opportunities, uh, whether it be celebrity or not. Great. Thank you, Nicholas, for sharing uh, with us your insight. And now the floor is open for questions. Jonathan. Jonathan's going to prime the pump. Yeah. Green light. Um, I just want to follow up on Babette's question about um, data in the restaurant sector. Would you be willing to um, provide data from your restaurants to an industry? Um, like a star? Exactly. Yes. Um, I don't see why not. I think that um, with the advent of the star report um, and the ability to share uh, market results and having that be such an important and integral part of any ownership discussion, any type of positioning, any type of doubt about performance. I think the star has been tremendously helpful in the industry. Um, we do business with a company that consolidates all the social media feedback from customers and their comments and so forth. It's called Revenate. It's been around for a while, but that's another very clever kind of consolidated third party that you can drop your set in, your competitive set, and see how you do relative to your competitors. I like all those things and think I would participate in order to get that kind of visibility on the data, yeah. Yeah. As long as you're not giving away company secrets, why not? Yeah. Come on, make me feel good. Ask a question. <laughs> Over here. Yeah. I can, yes. Thank you. Um, the question is about the R&B division that you've just formed in Jumeirah and clustered some of your restaurants. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that and in some of the other departments where Jumeirah has declustered. So what was the rationale of clustering food and beverage and declustering, for example, sales and marketing? Um, I'll talk a little bit about the R&B quickly. Um, it's a Two years ago, the group didn't have any kind of corporate function or oversight into the restaurant business for our hotels. Um, it, it, that is a little unusual given the scale of restaurant operations we had. We did have a, uh, it was called Jumeirah Restaurant uh, Group um, that looked after the Noodle House franchise, some other casual dining franchise, and some other kind of brands that we owned the rights to uh, and some of those brands were Ivy and uh, Rivington Grill and so forth and so on. That restaurant group, uh, they did their best and they made some growth and they, they did a reasonable job. But quite frankly, we wanted to take it to a bigger scale. So basically, we've taken that same company. We're going to change the name of it. We're going to incorporate more products in it. And we're going to invest in it and um, really give it scale. And so it's really just about you know being kind of a taking a leadership position here in Dubai. Um, we had a lot of uh, a lot of our new products, our new looks came online 15 years ago, 14 years ago, as many as 10 years ago. 
and it was really a time for heavy capex in our property, in particular in the restaurants. And uh, so this cycle we're going through last year, this year, the next year, the next year, we'll do, I don't know, 50 plus new concepts and renovations in the inventory. So it just seems like the right time to be out in front. I think the way the company was some 15 years ago when it kind of came on this, the stage here in Dubai from an F&B standpoint. And the other moves are really about uh, putting back on property some accountability as it related to driving the top line in general. Uh, probably what we'll end up with is some type of hybrid where we do some collective activities and then some still at the property. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Referring back to your story of the chap working on his career path versus the entrepreneurial restaurateur, without knowing about anything about Jumeirah, I would have an expectation that your you're setting up the R&B division in a way that would also function as an incubator for outsider concepts that you would then take in, eliminate part of the hard cost of experimenting, and then grow in that way. Obviously, I do not know whether there's something happening in, in any direction, and, and, and that's my question. Uh, do you intend to transform the R&B uh, division into this type of incubator that attracts outsider concepts? Or is it just a, a fantasy that I have now, having heard your uh, attitude towards career versus entrepreneurship? If I understand your question, you articulated it very well, and I was thinking maybe it's me and how late I was up last night. But um, I actually don't think I articulated what, well. It's just that <laughs> that's the best I can do with the time frame I had to think about it. I think you did a good job. Um, I would say that... Um, we, we have and will grow greater our capability to um, define concepts. Do the initial creative work and say, this is what we dream about. Here are the mood boards. Here's how it's going to work. You know, the design concept, basically, um, or, or concept design. And then what we won't do is get into the interior design business. But we will design operate. And we will be less inclined to attract brands that are already established when we could do it ourselves. Perhaps so we'll I build brands in-house versus work with already established brands, typically speaking. And, but I always say, keep the door open. You never know. Um, I'll give a try just for a rephrase, and I promise this is the last iteration. If entrepreneurial spirit is important in the creation of new, of new restaurant concepts, how do you get that? if in-house growing is not really an option because of the, the traditional way in which the industry grows its uh, talent? So this business is outside of the hotel business. So it's, we, what we've done is we take people that actually understand and work in an independent restaurant um, arena, if you will, uh, some in hotels, but they kind of get the premise behind that. But we actually look for people that have done freestanding work well um, and we track them because they're professionals in the restaurant business and therefore, and this business is physically is separate from the hotel. I probably will ultimately, I will ultimately recruit someone who would do the corporate food and beverage for everything except for this independent restaurant business. New openings, uh, you know, facilitating success in some area because we're a management, we're also a hotel management company and we have 22 hotels to manage, and we have a pipeline of another 20 hotels coming, so we need, we need somebody to look after all the other stuff. But we separate it, to answer your question, physically separate it. Yeah, I'm, I got it there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Nicholas. Any more questions? No. Sorry, um, I had a question yeah, regarding what's your percentage of in-house grown concepts versus external entrepreneurial ideas that come in in terms of application? And do you, how, how often do you actually accept an external application for, for to, to be part of your restaurant um, group? I see. I think you're asking about our decisions to lease out space in, the, in, the, in, the, in any of the hotels here in particular, yeah. Or in another hotel internationally. Um, we have um, recently 
come to an agreement, and uh, oh, it's actually been some time in the making, but uh, probably will launch by the end of the year a nightclub concept at Madinat Jumeirah, and that is a third party who is leasing the space. CapEx is the space, operates the space for quite a long, you know, for quite a long arrangement. And um, so that, for us, that was a good decision. Um, whether it's just be the expertise in running clubs, whether it be the CapEx at the time, whatever, you know, the basis for our decision making, but we have an occasion and we'll continue to look at when it's right to say, hey, this is a good piece of lease income and um, we don't see where it fits in the portfolio, but that won't be the case when the venue is of reasonable size, scope, view. You know, if it's a good box, I'm, I'm going to want the company, the R&B company to do it. If it's a box that someone else thinks is interesting and we don't, uh, then let them go at it and give it their best shot. So we'll generally run things ourselves, but we do have these, uh, we have a Jamie Oliver's that opened not long ago at the Jumeirah Beach Hotel. Certainly that's simply a lease and they did all the work to get it to where it is today. So, does that answer your question? Thank you. One more. Somebody's gonna give a ringer, yeah. a zinger. Oh, I hope it's not a zinger. Nabil Al-Khalid Asiko. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask you from experience um, another specific question. So you brought a specific example from Medina Jumeirah. Specifically looking at Emirates Towers and the Boulevard and the transformation that that's seen over the past five years in terms of F&B uh, with, you know, with clients seeing Hakkasan and, and the Ivy and the Alfred Dunhills. So after a few years of operation of, of those outlets, what are some of the lessons that, um, that Jumeirah has learned uh, in, in terms of uh, the different kinds of models that you can operate restaurants and, and what would you not repeat in terms of... Um, a specific model, and what would you certainly would repeat based on mm -hmm. performance that you've seen from those uh, outlets? I know the one thing I know for sure, and that's the food and beverage outlet in the Dubai Mall is going to be a lot busier than at the Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were talking about non-licensed, and I was sitting there thinking to myself, there are some places where it just works, and Dubai Mall is one of them, isn't it? Or Mall of the Emirates as well, but um, I would say that... Um, I would say that we are in the middle of a kind of a complete, you know, kind of a repositioning exercise around the boulevard and then all of the tenants and so forth and so on in a very positive way. We've seen some, uh, for a while there, it was kind of, um, it was kind of uh, low volume, uh, not really as appealing as we wanted it to be. We've seen occupancy pick up. We've seen some very nice brands go in there. There is a big dining component to that. We put some other lifestyle things in there around health, around um, beauty, and, and so forth and so on, around convenience. And I think it's a lot more dynamic place than it uh, has been in the past, recent years. Um, interesting that we, we hung in there with our Ivy concept, which was one of the brands that we actually kind of own for a term, if you will, and actually pay royalties back to London on. And uh, it's funny because that business just wasn't taking off, but it, it's funny we had, finally we found the right management. It was all about the manager. And um, it's a little bit scary in this business, of course, because when you find someone like that and you see them affecting your business in such a dramatic way, you sit there and say, well, I hope they never leave. Well, you better pay them well if you don't want them to leave. And that's what we might be faced with because I, I think it's been one or two people there that have made all the difference and we've grown the business, you know, 20% for two years now and made, and, and that is now a profitable restaurant. But boy, when I first got here, it was really tough and uh, was not apparent what the problem was other than it wasn't in a, a very high volume footfall location. So um, we also have learned, don't ever open to the same kind of concepts right next to each other. That doesn't <laughs> work so well. Um, you know, a few things like that, so. Thank you. Yes, hello. I'd like to ask you a question about the Jumeirah's strategy outside Dubai and outside the, 
Uh, I mean, in countries like such as uh, Kuwait or, or KSA, Saudi Arabia, what would be your strategy in terms of restaurant developers? Uh, because uh, uh, you don't benefit from the alcohol uh, yes. uh, permit that you have here in, in the UAE. We opened, uh, uh, in March of last year, we opened a hotel in Kuwait. It was a redevelopment of a hotel that had been there, but I mean, really pretty much from scratch. It has about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven restaurants in it, probably six real sizable ones. And, um, you know, it happens to be that Kuwait is a big dining uh, destination, and um, none of them, of course, are licensed, and they trade very well, and it really kind of has made the image of the hotel locally, because most people don't stay in our guest rooms, as you know. Uh, most people locally that live in that area, they just basically are interested to come to the hotel for the food and beverage experience. We are a late entry compared to our competitive set, so everything is new. All our designs are new, all our operating supplies, you know, new is good. Um, you know, you get the benefit of the current thinking and so forth. So I think that, um, as noted earlier, Grant was talking a little bit about, you know, when in Rome, you just adapt to whatever, you know, whatever the norms are and, you know, the principles of great food, great service, and entertain me must be there. You know, one of the things you think about is that I have a memorable, I mean a memorable food experience every once in a while. I go back to places because it entertains me to do so. Food could be really good, but not memorable like I'll never forget that food. It's usually because it's all the picture, the vibe, the music, the setting, the, the good-looking people that work there, how they treat me and welcome me back. I mean, it's funny because we talked about the Ivy earlier. I went there a few times in the beginning. They treated me really well, recognized me. I was, uh, it was a good, smart career move for them, but, um, but it's one of my favorite places today to go and feel comfortable. It's like, a, you know, it's like that Cheers, the, the, the sit comedy that was there all along. Everyone knows your name. That's right. So it's, um, I, I, I think we can't forget that we're, we're in the entertainment business, in the restaurant business, and whether it's interaction at the table, whether it's person at the door, whether it's something about the design, something, you know, some kind of atmosphere that you create, it's really, really important to, to understand if you've got a space and you're not entertaining people, it won't be successful. She did such a good job of prompting me. <laughs> Any more? Okay. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Are you going to stay? Sure. Yeah, I'm staying. And now I would like to welcome Mrs. Dawn Sweeney. So, hello, Dawn. She's the president and CEO of the National Restaurant Association in the USA. Uh, she took the helm at the end of 2007, and before joining the NRA, uh, she was president and CEO of AARP Services, which is the wholly owned taxable subsidiary of AARP. Uh, Dawn has been named one of the perennial top association CAOs in the country for the past several years in the States. She serves on the boards, the U.S. Travel Association, and the Women's Food Service Forum. She's an active member of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Committee of 100, the International Women's Forum, and the Committee of 200, an international network of female executives. She is also a charter member of Child Obesity 180. So welcome. So our session today with Dawn is going to be about strategies for engaging with the government and building a successful restaurant industry. So I will start with our first question. Uh, do you feel that government involvement in regulating the industry is an enabler, and, or you, would you rather describe it from your own experience? So based on uh, what we see in the United States, and I'm learning increasingly about uh, some of these challenges around the world, the National Restaurant Association represents uh, the US-based restaurant industry. So a million restaurants 
with annual sales of $680 billion US and um, 13 million employees. So actually, uh, uh, second to the healthcare industry in the US, the restaurant industry is the largest employer uh, in the country. And roughly 10% of the workforce in the US is employed in the restaurant industry directly. And close to 50% of people who, uh, of working age in the, rest, in the uh, total uh, economy have worked at some point mm -hmm. in the restaurant industry. So it's a far reaching, very impactful uh, industry that is growing, but certainly not at the rate that was expressed uh, earlier by some of the other speakers in terms of uh, some of the more emerging markets. When I came into the role at the end of 2007, the US restaurant industry had had 18 years of consecutive growth. And then in 2008, coincident with, but not because of my arrival, there was a big uh, <laughs> drop off yeah. and uh, co connected to obviously the, the recession and some of the challenges that were happening in the US at that time. Uh, we've now returned to multiple years of, uh, of growth. But I would say that one of the biggest challenges we face in the US in terms of growing and uh, maintaining a large growth cycle for the restaurant industry in particular are the uh, kind of the regulatory and governmental environment. So of course, depending upon who's elected as president and uh, who runs the uh, various branches of government, the Senate and the Congress, uh, which party's in power at any given point in time, mm -hmm. uh, changes the dynamic in terms of the challenges that the industry faces. Uh, particularly now, because of uh, the importance and the emerging focus on things like healthcare reform, uh, our industry has been under a huge amount of challenge in the last several years. Because the profit margin in the US, the average profit margin of the restaurant industry is in the neighborhood of uh, four to six percent, which is extremely small, small profit margin for any industry and uh, particularly given the amount of uh, labor costs, and food costs and uh, real estate costs and all the other things that the industry uh, faces that very small margin becomes easily eroded when some, just one piece of legislation, for example, uh, what's called the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, Affordable Health Care Act in the US uh, is put into place. So many restaurateurs are facing an environment where if they were to fully implement the law the way it was originally written, it could actually eradicate, remove all profit margin that they have. Mm -hmm. So it's been a huge issue uh, that's faced our industry. We have been working as an organization to uh, try to impact the way that the legislation has been written and gets executed and implemented. For example, the uh, law says that anyone who is considered a full-time employee in any industry, a uh, full-time employee if they work 30 hours or more a week. That is very inconsistent with other parts of the government's regulation about full-time employees being 40 hours a week or more. And when you're in the restaurant industry, where you don't have a typical kind of nine to five workforce, you're oftentimes you know, having 18, 20, 24, in some cases, hour shifts that you're trying to cover. Uh, the idea of having a full-time employee at 30 hours a week is really very challenging. So I would say in response specifically to your question that uh, Infrequently do we find government regulation to be an enabler and a help. Mm -hmm. uh, more frequently do we find it to be challenging and difficult, but the job of the industry and the organization that I represent in particular is to try to impact those regulations so that they are less harmful than they otherwise would be, and every once in a while actually put something forward that can be helpful. For example, uh, uh, tax deductibility of meal expenses, for example, or uh, work that we've been doing more recently uh, to try to see around the corner related to uh, nutrition labeling, which I can uh, talk more about, but particularly important, I think, when you see where the government is going, trying to figure out a way to come around and, yeah. and create a leadership position for the industry so that we are not on just the receiving end of all the negative challenges, but we're actually on the forefront trying to create an environment that will propel our success uh, more easily. Oh, excellent. So how do you think that we can b benefit from the U.S. market experience? Uh, what can be like uh, things that you can uh, 
tell us more about so that we cannot, so we do not have to reinvent really the wheel in our region? So I've been here for like 15 hours and I only slept about four of them and the rest of the time I've been out running around trying to learn as, and see as much as I can and of course I immediately go as any good research scientist in the restaurant industry do to the Dubai Mall to see okay. uh, what is uh, really happening. And I was just amazed, as everybody uh, who would go there for the first time I'm sure would be, uh, to see the um, vibrancy and the uh, excitement and the uh, wonderful entrepreneurial uh, spirit. And it was interesting to me to see how many U.S. brands obviously are represented uh, in the marketplace here, but also to see the way that the brands have, in some cases, tweaked a little bit to be uh, more connected to the local marketplace. In some cases, adopted. they've adopted, yeah. thank you, uh, adopted their model or adopted a little bit of their brand uh, to be relevant to the marketplace here. So I think. Certainly in the U.S., one of the big lessons that we have learned um, is to be able to, and Nic uh, Nicholas said it earlier, this idea of, um, of being relevant to the market that you're serving and at the same time uh, capturing that experience. So the experiential nature of the brand, certainly in the U.S., from what I've seen uh, here, uh, that experience is so critically important, and particularly when you're on a global stage as you are here. You know, in the U.S., we work very hard to try to bring international tourism, and uh, we know that uh, in some cases, aspects of our market, in the case of fine dining, for example, 40% of the customers in a fine dining restaurant uh, are the result of tourism coming from outside the region. It may, not, it may be several states away, it might be overseas, but that is a thing called kind of culinary um, tourism, mm -hmm. where people actually are traveling intentionally to be able to experience the food of that part of the world. And uh, our tourism in the U.S. is not where it needs to be. Uh, it's clearly here, when you look at the, uh, the percentage of people that are coming from overseas, uh, outside the region, that's a huge opportunity to showcase uh, the, that culinary experience, whether it be Western uh, brands or others. And so it's, uh, it's fascinating to me just to see uh, the way and regulation not being such a, from what I can tell, uh, kind of heavy-handed, a little more flexibility, a little more openness, a little more kind of um, laboratory in its mm -hmm. nature gives, I think, restaurateurs in this region a huge amount of opportunity uh, to maybe experiment a little more, uh, obviously understanding the, the baseline issues of food safety and things of that nature that are non-negotiable. Uh, but to be able to experiment a little bit more and try some things uh, that you might not be able to do in other parts of the world. But we still, we can see lots of interest from this region for American brands. Oh, yes. But we are seeing as well a lot of going back to basics is in many of the concepts here in our region, which is true. It's wonderful to see the brands, the yeah. U.S. brands that have come here and been so exactly. successful. Uh, their markets may be somewhat challenging in the U.S. at this time, and then they can come here and just have enormous success, and it helps to create um, an environment so that they can then reinvest in, in new markets. Exactly. So, Dawn, what's, in your opinion, the qualities of success of a restaurant in any market? Because I think that this is global. It's not pertinent to any region. I, I think you are right about that. One of the things that we see, um, and I think it is global, I know it's true in the U.S., uh, that the amount of disposable income that an individual consumer has is a huge, uh, has a very high direct correlation to uh, their interest and ability, obviously, to eat out. In a place yeah. like this, where uh, income, average income is so much higher than it is in other parts of the, uh, of the world, and also where disposable income is higher, uh, that's a huge driver. We have, in the U.S., kind of this experience of what we call pent-up demand. People want to eat out more often than they do but they either can't afford to or their lifestyle isn't conducive to it or there's other yeah. challenges. Um, so the average person, and we've seen this particularly during the recession, if you were eating out as a family twice a week, now you're eating out once a week. If you were eating out four times uh, a quarter, now you're eating out twice a quarter. If you mm -hmm. were eating out six nights a week, now you're just eating out three nights a week. You're cutting back. And this is a huge issue for us in the U.S. that I hope uh, other the regions like this won't have uh, that experience anytime soon because that pent-up demand is 
lost dollars to yeah. us as an industry. It's lost profit. It's lost opportunity. Uh, what you want to do is to, what I think we all want to do is to be able to create uh, sufficient experiences that people who are going out to eat exactly as often as they want to and not having to hold back. And we have that challenge now in the U.S., uh, which I hope that uh, markets uh, such as Dubai won't have. That experience. Yeah, no, I think in Dubai uh, we, we do not have that. In other parts of the region, probably it can be more the impact of uh, the instability that can, uh, that can really affect as well how much people are going out to restaurants. Yeah. So, uh, in, in few words, what are your views uh, for our industry in the coming years in terms of where to invest, in which segments? I think there's no better time. Uh, to be in the restaurant industry when you think of the exploration and the growth and the opportunities and the openness of the consumers today to mm -hmm. new ideas and new markets and, and almost the demand for new experiences. I think there's probably no better time uh, to be in the restaurant industry than today. And I do think that uh, all the various segments, in our, whether it's uh, the casual dining segment, more family-oriented, or what we call in the U.S. fast casual, which is a really fast-growing segment, uh, in the U.S., fine dining, uh, quick service, even off-premise things like hospitals and, and universities, uh, they're all seeing growth, and they're all seeing in their own way uh, opportunities for expansion. And so I think there's no, no greater time uh, to be in this industry anywhere in the world, uh, particularly uh, in a region like this where there's so much excitement and vitality. Great. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you. And Please feel free to ask any questions. Yes, hello. hello. Um, you actually touched on the point that I was going to ask about, so it will be an easier question and a follow-up. Uh, yeah, toward the end, you mentioned about the different segments that are available within eating out in the U.S. and how fast casual specifically is uh, really growing uh, faster than that of its other faster than the other subsegments of eating out. I was just curious what what, uh, what caused the emergence of fa fast casual from your experience and your exposure to the market, and uh, do you see? casual dining as something that will be declining as a result of the emergence of fast casual, or do they serve two different uh, needs? I think casual dining for many years uh, was really the emerging category and was growing very rapidly. Lots of different brands and lots of different ex expansions, so multiple locations building very quickly in that segment. And then uh, the fast casual segment, which really is defined more as, uh, so the way we think of it is, you know, it, it's kind of the, where you pay in the cycle. So casual dining, you sit down, you order at your table, you pay at the end of your meal. Fast casual, you typically go in, order often at a counter, uh, and then pay then and then be seated. So uh, that's kind of the differentiation as we see the definitions. But fast casual uh, really emerged, I think, in large part due to consumers' interest in uh, greater convenience, the ability to go in and get a very high quality meal, uh, oftentimes family oriented, uh, many times not, but a very high quality food experience, but in a setting that, is, that takes a less, less time. And so when, with the emergence of fast casual, I think that put more pressure on the casual dining segment to differentiate itself. Uh, and so a lot of the casual dining uh, experiences had over the years created a kind of a monochromatic experience. So casual dining in one brand was similar to casual dining in another brand, where fast casual, each of them had their own individual kind of um, brand notes and experience. So we have a council within the National Restaurant Association called the Fast Casual Council, and it's the CEOs of all those emerging uh, in, in, uh, concepts that have really done a great job of differentiating themselves, not just as a segment of fast casual from the other segments, but differentiating themselves from each other. And so uh, that is the, definitely the fastest growing uh, subcategory within the various concepts in the US. And think in large part from what I've seen and what I've heard and read um, due to the consumer convenience that's experienced there. And they've been really been at the forefront of uh, giving nutritional information and providing uh, additional insights to consumers 
uh, even before required to do so. And I think that has had uh, an element of uh, success to it as well. Any more questions? Okay. One thing I just might add that might be of interest, um, I think, uh, yeah. to others that are considering, uh, we talked a little bit about nutrition labeling in the U.S. And uh, there is a uh, piece of legislation that was passed now three years ago. It hasn't taken effect yet due to regulatory uh, requirements and things like that, that will require restaurants that have 20 or more locations under the same brand name to include calorie counts on their menus or their menu boards uh, or however they So convey. even if it's not a diet menu? No, it does not. It no just matter has what to it have is, all the no, calories. It okay. has no matter what the item is on the menu. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires that the, uh, the restaurant company divulge the number of calories that are in that item. And that, I think, as we look around the world and we see different uh, trends that are happening in other parts of the world, uh, this will be kind of a first um, bit of an experiment, I think, of sorts. Uh, and because it has been three years in the coming and it still hasn't gotten implemented yet, a lot of restaurant companies have looked at items on the menu and they've begun reformulating and using other ing different, talking with their supplier companies uh, to provide uh, different profiles because uh, there is an interest, I think, in uh, making sure, obviously, the calorie information is accurate but also as that becomes to be uh, published actually on the menu or the menu board, uh, potentially creates uh, additional information for consumers that are taken into account as they dine out. So mm -hmm. uh, just something to watch for. I don't know how prevalent that will become uh, around the world, but it, uh, the impact of that is yet to be, yet to be felt. Okay, great. Thank you, okay. Dawn. Thank you. And thank you for sharing with us your experience. Great.